everyone to Chevalier's Online. Um, we have a very timely event for you. I think during the past couple months, a lot of us during COVID and the political and cultural upheaval in this country have rediscovered or maybe discovering for the first time um, our kitchens, seeking comfort, nostalgia, sustenance. Um, but the kitchen is also a place of revolution. So we're very happy to have with us Catherine Alford and Kathy Gunst to share their new book, Rage Baking, The Transformative Power of Flour, Fury, and Women's Voices. Catherine has spent the last 20 years at the Food Network where she was the Senior Vice President of Culinary. She's run a test kitchen that's produced cookbooks, topping food and wine's best of the best lists and have been New York Times bestsellers. Kathy is a James, Sport, uh, James Beard award-winning journalist and the author of 15 cookbooks. And she's also the resident chef of NPR's Here and Now. Her writing has appeared in the Washington Post, Eating Well, Food and Wine, among many, many, many others. Um, the event that we have tonight is going to be fantastic. And if you are interested in purchasing a copy of Rage Baking, you can email us at chevaliersbooks at gmail.com or find it online at our bookshop. Um, so now I'm gonna pass it over to Kathy and Catherine who have uh, two fantastic demos. And then during these demos, if you have any questions about what you're seeing, um, feel free to drop one in the chat and I'll facilitate asking them. And later on, we'll have a Q&A session where you can ask the questions yourself. Thank you so much. This is Kathy. Um, maybe you've heard me on the radio when my voice sounds better. I've got some kind of allergies going, so sorry about that. Um, we are going to demo two really great dishes from Rage Baking tonight. Um, try to take you, show you a super simple one and then something a little more complex. Um, we're also going to spend some time talking about Rage which I personally have a great deal of these days, and baking, which I have been doing an enormous amount of since lockdown, since the pandemic began. And apparently we are not alone. Um, one of the very first things to sell out in grocery stores when the pandemic hit was flour, sugar, and yeast. So people are baking like crazy and many people for the very first time. Um, Catherine and I have known each other for 10 years, more? Something I, like yeah, that. Yeah, over 10 years. Yeah, um, and we, this project began during the Kavanaugh hearings, back when life seemed simple. Um, this was the fall of 2018 and I started watching the hearings obsessively. I could not turn them off. And at the end of the day, I was just out of my mind watching all this. I live in Maine and our Senator, not my Senator, but our Senator Susan Collins was very pivotal during the Kavanaugh hearings. And that made me even crazier. And what I would do each night is I would find myself in my kitchen and I would start baking and I would bake a pie, and then I would bake a cake, and then I would bake some cookies. And this baking went on throughout the hearings, and Catherine and I were talking quite a bit. And what happened was that the baking helped to ground me, which I suspect is some of what's going on during this pandemic, that many people have found that the very soothing healing process of taking butter, sugar, and flour and transforming them into a gorgeous cake or a beautiful summer pie is helping them get through a very difficult time. And it might seem counterintuitive that we want to be baking and doing something very specific while we're going through this kind of really strange time. I mean, it is stranger every single day. I don't need to tell you that. Um, so Catherine and I talked and we went back and forth and there was a lot of baking going on. And eventually we started to talk about the idea of doing a book. And we knew that we didn't want it to be just our recipes, that it wasn't gonna be just a collection of sort of our greatest hits. We knew we wanted to reach out to women from all over the country, all kinds of women, young, old, black, white, Jewish, Palestinian, straight, trans, 
Latinx. I mean, we really reached out to women that were bakers, activists, uh, writers, um, musicians, theater people. And we got these beautiful essays and interviews and recipes. And that was the basis for Rage Baking. Do you want to talk a little bit about what that was like, Catherine? Yeah, so Kathy and I were talking a lot, obviously. Can you hear me? Am I? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, when we, as Kathy said, when we were doing this book, we knew we did not want it to be just about us, that it was a collective. And one of the things that we know is that the kitchen has always been a place where women get together and, you know, commune, talk, and this transformation of raw ingredients into something pleasing and also so that you share. So the baking is, is it's obviously it's kind of a metaphor for what we were like the change we want to see happening in the country. Um, and then the more we got into it, we really started thinking about it. It's like, you know, when you make um, a bread or a pie or a cake, it's always a communal action. You're always like sharing it with others. So that was very important to us as well of bringing people together. And one of the things also about doing this book is we knew that we did not want it to just be a cookbook. It had to be more than that. And it was a tool for the election. Um, and so we wanted it to have a pro-social point of view. So um, a pro proceeds, part of the proceeds from the book, the sale of the book will go to Emily's List. And Emily's List, if you're not familiar with, is an organization that supports progressive women candidates. And I think most people always thought that Emily was a person. Um, but um, it actually stands for early money is like yeast. So it's like raising money trans and helping women get into office. And we were so excited to be supported by Emily's List. And just to realize this moment that we're in, they shared when we were talking to the, um, the president of Emily's List, in 2016, they had like over maybe a thousand women that they were working with. And by 2018, it was 30,000 women in different um, elections that they were working on, from local school boards to all the way up, hopefully, to um, make some real changes in this country. So this book has really, it was like, came from a very emotional place, but also that the, and, and passion and a little bit of anger, but then also, just as women get together, you know, the, the baking and the community is also really an important part of this. And um, there's the writing in this book. We knew that we did not want to do a traditional cookbook. So we have poetry and essays and the amazing photography of the story of how all women relate to this idea of rage baking. And it, it's, it's, it was, we, well, Kathy can talk about how we thought we were all going to get the same thing. And the diversity of voices is really kind of extraordinary. Yeah, we, I reached out to maybe a dozen different women writers. And the prompt that I gave them was simply, what does the words rage and baking elicit for you? And I sent them out and I called Catherine and I'm like, oh man, I blew it because I think we're going to get 12 identical essays. But of course, everybody comes to this from such a different place. And in fact, the essays range from really, really moving and sad to absolutely hilarious to uplifting. Um, everybody came to this, that they, everyone related to the word rage, as most women do, particularly in this time but also the place that baking or the kitchen holds for them. Um, before we get started with the demo, I just wanted to read you the quote that prefaces the book from Maya Angelou, because it is so appropriate for what's going on right now. She says, you should be angry. You must not be bitter. Bitterness is like cancer. It eats upon the host. It doesn't do anything to the object of its displeasure. So use that anger, you write it, you paint it, you dance it, you march it, you vote it, you do everything about it, you talk it, never stop talking about it. 
that really spoke to us. And then right below it, we have a very short quote from Gloria Steinem that says, the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. So on that note, um, I am going to make what I call a wild Maine. I live in Maine and apologies for those of you that have joined late for my voice. I've got something going on, but I'm here. Um, so during the Kavanaugh hearings, Susan Collins, the Senator from Maine, who on Tuesday, we voted in the primary and we voted in Sarah Gideon, who is a fiery, smart Speaker of the House, who I believe is really gonna win this. And um, Susan Collins really turned her back on the people of Maine, as well as the women of Maine. She voted for Kavanaugh, as you all know. She took $5 million from Mitch McConnell. Anyway, I named this recipe for her. It's called the Maine Blueberry Supreme Court Crumble because she crumbled badly. So it is berry season in Maine and I am so lucky. I live here and I have wild raspberries and blueberries all in my fields and behind my house. So I'm going to make a very simple crumble and you can make this with blueberries, wild blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, whatever berries you have on the West Coast, really can mix it up. What is so great about a crumble is that it's so much easier than a pie because all you do is mix berries and as you're gonna see, you make this crust on top. So check out these raspberries. You see those? They are luscious. I'm gonna take three cups of berries. I'm gonna mix blueberries. And I'm gonna mix, can you see that? Yeah, you look good, it looks good. All right, and then I'm gonna mix in some of these raspberries. There's some blackberries in there. Oh, I'm gonna put them all in. This is the most incredible year for raspberries that we've ever, ever had. Um, okay, then I'm, it's very simple. I just want to very lightly flavor the berries. I don't wanna overwhelm them. I'm gonna add one tablespoon of flour because the, jerry, the berries, when they're this fresh, leach a lot of juices so the flour will help it stay together. Next, I'm going to add a third of a cup of granulated sugar. It's very humid here today, so everything is kind of sticky. Just lightly stir them. These raspberries are fairly fragile. I'm going to add a teaspoon and a half of lemon zest. Um, I just used a microplane and an organic lemon. And if you don't have organic, even if you do, you always wanna wash it. And the zest is the yellow part on the outside, not the bitter white pith. So I use a microplane and I just go around the lemon like this. And the lemon is a good friend to blueberries. Really picks up the sweet sour flavor of a blueberry. I think it would work just as well with huckleberries, blackberries. And I'm going to add two tablespoons of fresh lemon juice. Again, just to highlight, pinch of salt. Salt, people generally don't use in baking, and you should. It brings out the sweetness. It brings out the flavors. So I've got my raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, a little flour, lemon, lemon juice, and add a few more blueberries. Just feeling it. Oh, and a touch of ground ginger. Ginger, again, is bright, flavorful, and really highlights the fresh berries. Just a pinch. I want to taste berries. I don't want to taste ginger or lemon, but the way that these all mix up together is beautiful. That's that. You can let it sit. It'll sort of macerate, the juices will come out. I'm gonna put that to the side. Next, we're gonna make a really simple crumb topping. Give me a minute here. Okay, this is important. Catherine taught me this at the very beginning when we started the book. We tested each recipe way too many times. We were fanatics about it. And we kept getting different results. Someone would send us a cookie or a cake and I would bake it and say, it's perfect. And she would bake it and say, 
I don't know, mine was heavy. So finally, Catherine asked me a deeply personal question. How <laughs> do you measure your flour? So this is a kitchen scale. They cost about 10 bucks. It's gonna change your life. It's gonna change your baking. Throughout Rage Baking, all our recipes for flour are given in grams. And the idea is that you will weigh everything. So this topping calls for 80 grams of flour. And Kathy, just to say that we also give them in, if you don't have a scale, we do give them in volume measurement, um, but it's just, it's the most consistent way to do it. And also you just measure it right in as Kathy's doing into the bowl. It's um, incredibly, it actually streamlines your, your baking. And what you can do each time is bring it back down to zero. So then if I was adding sugar, I could start over. So I've got 80 grams of flour there. Next, I'm going to add three quarters of a cup of your favorite granola. We have an incredible recipe in this book for granola by a chef named Mindy Fox. She is also based in Maine and she used to make this during her college days um, when she would go out protesting. So, you know, an old hippie recipe. It's delicious because it uses nuts and apricots and it gets kind of chunky. So I'm adding three quarters of a cup of granola. And then I'm going to add three tablespoons of light brown sugar. And I am going to add another pinch of ginger. Again, we're mimicking flavors. This is something that you'd see quite a bit in a pinch of salt too, in cooking as well as baking, that if you have two layers, it's really nice to use the same flavor in both layers so that you highlight these, all these flavors here. Okay, so I've got my sugar, my granola. Oh, sorry, I have to take my butter out of the fridge. And this um, crumble is like topping, could be used in the wintertime with apples or pears or figs or quince. I mean, it's really, and also sometimes when I will just make this crumble topping and leave it in the, the freezer. And it's like, if you have people come over, you know, for, well, when we used to have people come over, it um, is a great improvisational dessert. A virtual dessert party. So I'm taking a stick of butter, cut up into pieces, and I'm going to put it into my bowl here. Chilled butter. We don't want this to fall apart. Now, because it's summer and because I am a woman of a certain age, I tend to run hot. You could very carefully, can you see this? You might want to bring your camera down just a little bit. How's that? Yeah, that's good. So I'm coating the butter and I'm breaking it up because I want it to really be the size of sort of large breadcrumbs. But I can also use this, which is called a pastry cutter. And then I don't have to have the body heat of my hand in the way. And it's gonna cut the butter up and incorporate everything. And it kind of clumps together, but that's okay. Because we just take it off. This is how simple it is. You can make your berries ahead of time and make the topping ahead of time. And there we go, now it's breaking up. And then you can just pop it in the oven before somebody comes over, which hopefully will happen someday soon, or someone in your pod, or someone in your family, or you have an outdoor gathering, which is the only way that I get to see people, which is why I'm dreading winter, because I don't think I'm ever gonna see anybody again, because we get together outdoors all the time. Okay, so we've got clumping butter here. Okay, we've got our butter. This is nicely mixed up. Now, we have a lot of options. You can, what did I forget, anything? No, you're good. I'm good. So you can make this in a regular old pie plate, but that's a little bit boring. I have all these fun little individual sized dishes. So I'm gonna butter these very lightly. Butter, butter, butter. I just wanna butter the base. And this way, I can freeze a few since I have these beautiful fresh berries or I can have a gathering and everybody gets their own dessert. So what I do is I take my berries and I'm going to fill my container, not to the top because we want room for, 
Boy, these are so juicy already. Can you see that? Yep. I wish you could smell it. I'll make the next one. So that this is how simple it is. Then I'm going to take my topping and I'm going to put it on top and I'm going to gently push down on it. It's like creating a crust, but you don't have any of the fuss of rolling out a pie dough, which actually isn't very difficult. And we have some unbelievably fabulous pies in the book, but I love this crumble for the ease of it. Now, as I said, this could all be done in the morning and popped in the oven right before you're gonna serve it. So I'm taking all my toppings. You see, I'm sort of gently pressing down. Sorry, I know I'm cutting off my view here. Now I could do this in a pie plate. That's it. That's the whole thing. So this crumble is ready to go into a 350 degree oven for about 30 minutes. And miraculously, I have one ready. So let me put these over here. Zoom needs aromatherapy here. This is my finished, this is the larger one, obviously. Yeah, um, it smells pretty outrageous. So everything kind of gets golden brown, the fruit bubbles, you know it's ready when you smell it and when the fruit starts to ooze a little bit. And um, that is a wild Maine Supreme Court blueberry crumble. Also, we wanted to say if anybody has any questions as we're going, please either raise your hand or use the chat room. Anybody have questions on the crumble before we get started on a cherry focaccia? Okay. Great. Okay. All right, so- I'll um, just smell here. You'll, you'll do your thing. Okay, I'm just um, trying to, ah, ha, ha, not stop video. But, well, can everyone see, can, can everyone see, I need, hold on one second, the technological, um, there we, we go. We can see you, we can see the bowl. Right. Oh, the bowl, no. Hold on. Anyway, okay, I'm just on, uh, I want to get on speaker view, but there we go. Okay, anyway, here I am. And so, I'm making focaccia. Um, this is, this is a finished, this is where I'm going. This is the finished version. And as Kathy said, the, you know, the whole kind of revolution that we're having in bread making is really extraordinary. And focaccia is this sort of, this alchemy of like wheat, yeast, um, olive oil, lots of olive oil and air. I mean, and it, it is, it's an incredibly, um, simple bread to make. It's a great starter bread to do. And the thing about that you realize that when you make bread, that thyme is one of the, and I don't mean the herb, I mean the thing that we have so much of right now, that the long, slow rise of the focaccia makes it really what you want, which are these really great little air pockets of, I'm sure you can't really see on my little camera, but um, the most sort of open web structure. So, um, I mixed the dough already together about an hour ago. And this is a, tri a tip that we have um, in the book. And the book has tons of baking tips. Besides all the writing, it's also a very, very good useful tool. So what we do here, when you make a bread, they always say, wait till it doubles in size about the time. And I always know, like, I forget what time I did it or what double in size looks like. So I always say, take your plastic wrap, and I always reuse bags, do the original circle and note the time. And so then when you come back to it, you go, okay, yeah, that's doubled in size and it's been about an hour. So I have the dough and this focaccia dough is very wet. It's almost kind of like, well, really it's more like a batter and it feels like really kind of like, how can I actually even deal with this? And the thing about this recipe is you can, you really don't even have, you don't have to do all the kneading and all that goes along. It's very, very gentle and passive. So I take this 
and I'm pouring it out. And you see it's kind of, it's got already starting to get that structure of air. So I take it and I'm putting it into a lightly oiled pan. And then I'm gonna take this, a pastry scrape, which is like your best friend for this. And then you just kind of fold it. You're not gonna knead it in the way that you would do other kinds of bread, but you just kind of fold it in this, into a rectangle or like a letter. I go one way and then I go the other way. And this is just creating the structure for the bread. Can you see that it's sort of like folded over on top of each other? And I'm already beginning to see big air bubbles as it's growing and rising and it's alive, which is exactly what I want it to be. So I did this easy. Then I'm gonna take a plastic bag or saran wrap. We try to be as ecologically sensitive as we can. I'll take this and I'll just throw it in the refrigerator overnight. Done. Then the next day, it comes out, and the fact that it's been rising overnight, this long, slow rise is what really gives it its flavor. So now I want to, you know, this is going to make a, a recipe for about, you know, 10 to 12 people. So if like you're going to go through the whole process of making bread, you want to have something that you can, you know, have a, around for a while. And also this freezes beautifully. So here I have my bread and I have a sheet pan and my piece of parchment, okay, which I've been using all day long. And I want to take this and once again, this is your friend, the little pastry scrape. Oh, the wind is taking my, I'm not going to let that happen. And so I just turn this out. In fact, you know, you can kind of basically make this bread without ever really touching the dough because you're gonna use the pastry scrape. And now it's on here and there is oil in this recipe. And in fact, there's a good amount of oil in this recipe. And that's kind of what makes the focaccia so delicious and unctuous. So I have my piece of parchment and I wanna spread this out. Now, if I tried to spread this out with my hands, it would be kind of annoying and difficult. But by using the parchment, I can just stretch it out into the corners of the pan and it's it's just like a push and it is much more manageable this is a trick you can do also with pizza if you're doing like a roman style pizza i mean focaccia is kind of a roman style it's i mean related obviously whoopsie so i press this on out into the corners even it out Press it in a little bit here, a little bit there. And there is the focaccia. Can and you now I want it. Can you see it? Not there, that's better, yeah. Yeah, you can see it. I'm kind of not being perfect and that's okay. So it's sort of in there. And then I just take another sheet pan and just put it on top. I don't like to put anything right on the surface because it will stick. And I also want, here we go, as we say in TV land, swap out. Um, this is two and a half hours later and I've just left it at room temperature. And I want, I wish you could see, they're like all these like really great bubbles. That's we exactly what you want. It's like big, light, pillowy, airy. And I could just bake this right now, um, but I love, and I'm just gonna, when I see this, I get so excited because I'm like, I know where this is going, these big old bubbles. So I roasted just some grapes. And I, as I say in the recipe, I'm kind of a super nerd. I love to use my little chopsticks to like, and I, I also did some figs. So that's a fig and you just drop it in. And, thing, and it's just sort of, it just sort of falls right into the dough. Here's some we can't things. see the fruit. Oh, there we go. Um, and this is this is incredibly adaptable. You could do this with, and I've got a fig, I've got other grapes. Um, I'm also, we just did some cherries here. So I'm just gonna drop in cherries. You could do cherry tomatoes, you could do olives. 
you know, focaccia is kind of having its moment right now. Um, and by using like, these are amazing cherries that my husband puts up. This is his thing. He does them every year, really for his Manhattans that he um, drinks all winter. Um, and so I put these on, letting them fall in. And if this can be, if you do a little bit of sugar on top, even with the olive oil, it's kind of a traditional Italian thing. Um, you can serve it for brunch and I'm just gonna throw these around. I like sometimes putting um, fennel seed or fennel pollen on top. And then here is a little bit of rosemary. Could be savory. I have some savory from my garden as well. Um, just it's like think of the focaccia as sort of an open palette of all the different things that you could make sweet or savory. And in fact, you could do one half sweet and then one half savory. Um, and as tomatoes, little cherry tomatoes would come on here, little chili peppers, um, do that. And then just a little bit of, a little bit of salt on top. This looks, I mean, I, I'm sorry it's virtual, but this is kind of, um, it's like a pillow of dough and fruit and herbs and olive oil and salt and you smell the yeast and it's kind of amazing. This goes into the oven and then 30 minutes, uh, it gets golden brown. You're gonna have a focaccia factory there. I am, I have like done so many swap outs today that like you have it. So here, here this is like, this is this one here and the olive oil just like permeates it in a really fantastic way. Can and you, you hold get, it up for us for a second? Yep. Beautiful. And you have this like very open crumb, which is the sign of a wonderful focaccia. And focaccia and a glass of rosé kind of is the perfect way to start the weekend. I was like, okay, I'm going to have like, I'm going to be socially distancing and picnicking this weekend and raging about the state of our country. Everything. And then I will have my focaccia and my wine. That's beautiful, beautiful. Um, so listen, everyone out there, don't be shy. Let us know what looked hard, what looked easy, what questions you have. Tell us what you're raging about, what you're thinking about. Um, we are happy to, we want to talk about rage baking and we want to, um, I think I mentioned early on that a lot of the essays are really moving and some of them are quite angry, but some of them are also very funny. Um, and there's one in particular, and since Chevalier's books is in LA, I thought I'd read a paragraph in my gravelly voice by an LA writer named Tess Rafferty. And thank you to Nancy Pollock for introducing us. Um, and here's the first paragraph of her essay called The Revolution Will Be Catered. Here's the bad news, America. You've woken a white hot atomic geyser of rage in women. Here's the good news. We've brought cookies. By the time we got to June 2016, I was already fed up with the blatant and vicious sexism we were experiencing during the primaries. And that was just for my allegedly woke party. Somehow white men had reclaimed the word progressive, redefining it to no longer include the goals of women. The misogyny was coming from inside the house. Of course, that was just an amused douche to what we would experience in the general election as chance of lock her up morphed into grab them by the pussy. In case the message that America doesn't really care about women was getting lost, having people decide it's okay for a man to talk to you that way as long as they get a tax cut really sells it. And it goes on, but her humor, um, we needed it because there were a lot of pieces in this book, a lot of interviews. I got to interview the musician, Ani DeFranco. She talked about her rage and how music helps. She talked about raising two children and what it feels like to have a daughter and how you process rage and how you have to tamp it down now as a parent. Um, and then there is an incredibly beautiful poem by a woman named L. Scott Simone. Catherine, do you want to talk about that? 
Yeah, Elle is a, um, actually, a, she and I worked together years ago at Food Network, and she is an amazing woman. She started um, She Chef that mentors um, Black and African American and women of color in the food business. And Elle is the first woman of color to be on uh, PBS on, from, she works at Cook's Illustrated, and she's just a powerhouse. And so I reached out to Elle and I said, would you like to be part of the book? And she was like, yes. And I have to tell you, when we reached out to people through emails, et cetera, the response was, hell yeah. People wanted to be part of this project. And Elle said, oh, I'm gonna send you a lemon pound cake from my great grandmother. And I was like, great, wonderful, we need, we need it. We, we can't wait, she's a great baker. And then she said, and you know, I'm gonna send you a poem. Is that okay? And I was like, I had, I was like, oh, okay, yeah. I mean, this was free form. This book came together really fast. And Elle sent us this poem about her great grandmother um, who migrated during the Great Migration out of the South during Jim Crow to, and how she would use food and send her family north to Detroit. And you make that cake and you put it in the oven and then you read that poem and it just makes a connection, a, a, a virtual connection that is so powerful and how women have used food to connect and as a tool of change and for identity. And it was just, it was just very, very powerful. And there are other poems in the book and there, the essays um, are, are just terrific. One from Jennifer Boylan, um, the, uh, LA, uh, the New York Times opinion writer about her life in Maine. Um, and life during, quote, the troubles that we're in right now. Um, but it's, it's, it's not your regular cookbook. Um, the idea that we had was that you would make something and then sit down and read something and, and feel inspired or angry um, and, or, or laugh. I mean, when we were making this book, we, we were very angry sometimes, but then also, Kath, I, I like to name recipes I, and it's just fun. So like, for example, when the Alabama Supreme Court, I mean, excuse me, the Alabama um, House voted away women's choice, I just called Kathy and I said, Kathy, we have to have a pig in the blanket and dedicate it to those wonderful gentlemen and that woman who was the governor in Alabama. So we have Supreme Court crumble. We have a, a really easy, fantastic sheet cake that can be used as really um, a palette for any kind of messaging. I mean, we saw this everywhere that women were using cakes as messages. This, and so we have, a, I'm not taking any more of your sheet cake. And we have, don't call me honey, honey cakes and cookies and pies, no more humble pies. And all of this illustrated with incredible, beautiful photographs by the Victor Yeah, I'm gonna yeah, talk about, talk about the design uh, and the photographs. So there are some, yeah, you eat, drink your wine. I'm just smelling this. I'm, I'm trying to make it come to all of you there. Um, my mother-in-law was a photojournalist and we lost her a few years ago. And we've been going through thousands and thousands of negatives and black and white photographs. And I had a memory that there was a box somewhere that said early women's marches. And I thought, wouldn't it be incredible if I, if I could find that box of book of photos? And I looked and I looked and I couldn't find them. And then just as I was about to give up, there they were. And, and um, this is an early march from the 60s in front of the Pentagon. That oh, the White, White House. House, that's the White House. That's in front you know, of the White House. No, we feel like the White House has become the Pentagon, but that's the White House. That is the White House. The women are wearing fur coats, high heels, they have white balloons. So one of the reasons that it was so important to use these photos, aside from their beauty, is that they show you sort of two steps forward, three steps back. We're still fighting this fight. And to see these photos that my mother-in-law took and to find them in here was just incredible. Um, and then another really wonderful thing, I talked about how the women are all different women from all over. We have their photos here so that you can see these beautiful faces and identify them and say, oh, wow, that's her cake. That's her poem. That's her story. And then 
there's an incredibly talented photographer in Texas named Jarell Guy, and she did all the close-up color photos. This is my killer butter crunch that I make every holiday. Um, Jarell is incredibly talented. She did all the food styling herself. So the writing is very much a lot of different voices, but the visuals are also black and white, as well as color, vintage, as well as current pictures. So it really provides kind of a patchwork quilt of voices and images to try to express a little bit of this rage and a little bit of what, you know, it's really interesting because the idea of rage baking really goes back to the Revolutionary War when women did not have the right to vote, pre-suffragette. Um, women would go into the kitchen and bake what was called election cakes. They were these very dense, fruit-filled cakes. And this was women's way of expressing themselves. Election day back then was like a national holiday, but they did not have a voice. So they went into the kitchen and they baked. And really, I believe that rage baking goes back as early as that. During the civil rights movement, you hear about secret kitchens, kitchens where women baked to raise money and they would sell them sort of off the grid as a way to raise money for Martin Luther King, for civil right marches, for civil right causes. And now here we are today in this gigantic mess with losing our rights, losing our democracy, and we find ourselves baking again over and over, almost obsessively. And I can only speak for myself that I find the science and the precision of baking very grounding in a time when very little makes sense to me. This idea that if I follow the formula, if I pre-chill the butter, if I measure the flour, I will get a pie. I will get something beautiful. And there's so little these days that feels like it does what it's supposed to do. If you know what I mean, I'm being kind of vague, but for me, baking has been extremely grounding. And, oh, I see there are some comments here. Um, but I'd love to hear from you guys. Um, are you baking? Are you eating too much? Are you getting out? Are you stress baking? Are you procrastinating? baking? Are you rage baking? We're doing all of it. <laughs> Let's see what some of these. Um... It's nice to see people are like they're saying that there's um, going to the library and getting the book. Of course, we want to. One of the reasons we're so happy to be here at Chevaliers is that supporting independent bookstores, particularly in this time of COVID, is really important. Um, and you know, share rest, buy the book, share recipes um, with your like. And the thing that I love is like you make this. Uh, Kathy was talking about how people are really baking. And then they're like leaving it on people's doorsteps or connecting with that or taking pictures of it or using it when they go to a march. Um, this is something that, um, you know, it's a meta, obviously it's a very simple metaphor, but take something simple, mix it all together and hopefully you get something that something will transform. The, the subtitle of the book, the transformation, we all are desperate for transformation right now, just desperate from one day to the next. And we, when, we, when we started this book, we knew it was bad. We had no idea how bad it would really be. Um, and we want this to be, you know, get out there and vote. Um, if, if that's the least that you can do is get out there and vote and be, at, you know, it's very hard to go out into the streets right now. Some people feel comfortable marching, some people don't, but um, connect and have a community that you can share the desire and the passion for change. I see there's it's a okay comment. To, it's okay to be freaking mad right now. If ever there were a time. Um, Rachel says that she has become an artisanal, an artisan sourdough bread breaker. It gives me something to focus on besides the news. I hear you. I never had experimented with sourdough and a neighbor down the street gave me a little jar and I have been baking bread and bagels and focaccia 
really since mid-March. And it's not even that I want to eat this stuff, although I do. Um, but I have found ways to, in March, we had to fly home really quickly. So we were quarantined for two weeks and a neighbor did all our grocery shopping. So I started baking bread for them. I find the community aspect of this and the sharing is incredibly rewarding, even during this time when it's so difficult to be together. Um, as Catherine says, you leave it on someone's door. I've put muffins in mailboxes. That would be a good children's book title, actually. <laughs> but, but there, there are ways. Um, Rachel says she's not really eating it either, but her poor husband is growing. Hey. Yes, yes. No. You know? I have, I, 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 as I joke, I have my COVID-19. You know what? It's the least of our worries right now. So true. It's so true. When so many people are struggling so much, so and, and we don't see an end to it. I, th I think November is our chance um, and we just have to speak out and speak loudly. One of the things that comes up in essay after essay in this book is how women feel like people are constantly telling them to quiet down. Think about Hillary. Think about the campaign. They called her shrill. Well, I would not call that woman shrill when you think about what we've got going now. She's articulate. She has a voice and women need to use their voices now more than ever. And we have to just stop listening to people who tell us to tone it down because that is not working. Just like we see with the marches in the street, things are erupting now and they need to because there's been way too much oppression and we're really witnessing an incredible time in this country. And my hope, my prayer, I'm not religious, but my prayer is that we will move forward and that we can make some really big changes and never go back to this. So Nancy has a question, can focaccia be made with sourdough starter? I've been sharing mine with neighbors. Yes, it, absolutely. I mean, that's the, um, you know, that's what yeast used to be before we got the little packets of doing that. Um, I would look at a recipe and I, I'm sorry, I don't have the conversion. If you're going to use how much sourdough that you would need to use with this instead of using yeast, um, but I'm sure I'm online that you can do that. And the thing about working with the sourdough is if you're making it is it's like that long, slow rise is where bread happens. You know, when you get bread recipes that are like, okay, just do it in an hour and a half, it kind of hasn't developed the flavor. Um, these things take time, you know, change does take time. And um, the longer and slower something rises in a bread or, or a pizza dough or even a focaccia, the more development of flavor that it has. Um, generally, so sourdough I rise is really important in this. Generally, when I use sourdough in place of yeast, I find you need a bit more. So if it calls for a teaspoon of yeast, you probably need at least a tablespoon of sourdough and it will take longer to bubble and rise, but you will get that sourdough flavor and the payoff will be huge. So absolutely you can use sourdough. But I mean, that's what's wonderful about um, sourdough is like, it's alive. You know, the yeast is alive. And so every time you make it, it's a little bit different. Um, I used to joke, my husband for a while was doing a lot of sourdough baking and it was like, it was our, it was our second child. We were feeding it, you know, it demanded our attention and um, it was very, um, well, persnickety. <laughs> it, it had a lot of personality to it. So once you get comfortable with that in bread making, um, that's kind of the fun that it, it like each day is, it's, it's influenced by the humidity or the, uh, the temperature of the day. And that kind of skill um, and craft is also what's so important about um, baking and that um, the results are just definitely worth it. And every time you do it, I mean, some people will say, oh, I don't bake and that I don't want any complicated recipes. This book is definitely designed for home cooks. Um, when we reached out to the contributors, you know, some of them came back are very high end chefs and amazing pastry chefs. And they were like, I want to do this with cocoa nibs, that, who, who, and the other. And I was like, wait, we don't, this is going to be for people at home 
that are so, these are simple, accessible recipes. Um, and so, for example, Ruth Reichel, the former editor of Gourmet, sent us this incredibly simple oatmeal cookie. And well, Kathy, Kathy looked at it and said, "This must be wrong. There's something no, I wrong." Think she, she definitely left out some ingredients because there were four ingredients. So I, I mixed them up. I'm so suspicious. This was a recipe that a woman who was an old family friend used to bring when she visited. And Ruth said she was the first feminist she ever knew. These cookies are brilliant. They're lacy and crisp. And I have a friend who has a three-year-old daughter and he got a copy of the book and he called and he said, my daughter wants to rage bake. What should we start with? And I said, do Ruth's cookies because they're no fail. And a cookie is the best place to start and so much fun for kids. Um, then I have a recipe in the cookie chapter for chocolate chip tahini cookies. Tahini being ground sesame paste with sea salt and people just flip out over those cookies. The other thing that we haven't mentioned is that because we wanted this to be so user friendly, every chapter has two pages of tips. So these are special um, things that we've learned over the years that there's Ann Pat <laughs> um, that will help you. For instance, when you're baking pie, there are a lot of great tips um, of ways to create a delicate crust, ways to use the freshest fruit, whether you're making cakes or pies or cookies, we will hold your hand and get you through the recipe. There's nothing in here that takes more than a few hours, even the triple layer cakes, I think. Mm -hmm. So um, here's another recipe. Do most of the, I mean, another question. Do most of the sweet recipes use all-purpose flour rather than cake flour? Yes, um, I'd say 90% of the time. The bread recipes use bread flour, which is a higher protein. Um, cake flour is used occasionally in cake recipes, but you can always, what, Catherine, you triple sift? You, you, you can, if you can't find cake flour, um, you can add a little bit of cornstarch to it. Um, and the, in a lot of the cases, we tested them both ways and they'll, they'll be fine. Um, but, and we explained the difference of why you need different flours um, to be used. So, um, and get your flour because it's like, that's the first thing that's going at the supermarket these days. It's true. Any other questions? I'm still smelling my crumble here. I'm gonna dive in privately. <laughs> I hope you will share it. <laughs> So again, we would urge you to buy the book from an independent bookstore, hopefully from Chevalier Books. We urge you to get involved in this election, to make your voice heard, to vote, to try to get some change going as quickly as we can. And bake, share, rage, rage on. It's okay. We're yeah. going to get through this. Yes. Thank you all for being here. Oh, someone asked a question for the maple pull apart bread. I'm dying to try it, but it sounds daunting. Well, there's kind of a story behind this, which is I, you know, as I said, I love the titles of recipes and they inspire me. And so I said to Kathy, we have to have a pull apart bread, you know, as a great metaphor for what we were doing. And you know what some people call it monkey bread or pull apart bread. And so I, I kind of like, uh, after running the test kitchen at Food Network for over 20 years, I kind of I had my spreadsheets and all this kinds of things. So, um, and Kathy was, I was like, I'd probably done it 10 or 15 times. And around, Kathy was the, like, around the 15th time, I asked for the phone number of her therapist. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I was completely losing it. But Nancy, let me tell you, I was scared of it too, because it's got these layers. It's so well written and so well tested. You just make this dough, you create these balls, you let them rise, and you get the most beautiful bread. It's sweet and gooey and totally doable. You can do it. Yeah, okay. it's, it's everyone who's made it has been like, oh my God, it's very gratifying as the, as the person who created the recipe. But I really feel like, you know, our job as writers and, and recipe writers is to make it easy for you and we hold your hand through it and try to make, um, we want you to be successful. That's awesome. our goal. <laughs> yes, and it's got gooey maple syrup through it. It's just 
absolutely fabulous. And again, it won't be complicated. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you Stay very safe much. And try to have fun. Try to get out there, whether it's phone banking, but let's try to make some change here. And keep baking and enjoy it. Absolutely. Good night. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night.